Section 17 of Highways in Hiding by George O. Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 It would please me no end to report here that the gang at the medical center were crude, rough, vicious, and that they didn't give a damn about human suffering. Unfortunately, for my sense of moral balance, I can't. They didn't cut huge slices out of my hide without benefit of anesthesia. They didn't shove pipe-sized needles into me or strap me on a board and open me up with dull knives. Instead, they treated me as if I'd been going to pay for my treatment and ultimately emerged from the center to go forth and extol its virtues. I ate good food, slept in a clean and comfortable bed, smoked free cigarettes, read the best magazines, and also some of the worst, if I must report the whole truth, and was permitted to mingle with the rest of the patients, guests, victims, personnel, and so forth that were attached to my ward. I was not at any time treated as though I were anything but a willing and happy member of their team. It was known that I was not, but if any emotion was shown, it was sympathy at my plight in not being one of them. This was viewed in the same way as any other accident of birth or upbringing. In my room was another man about my age. He'd arrived a day before me with an early infection at the tip of his middle toe. He was, if I've got to produce a timetable, about three-eighths of an inch ahead of me. He had no worries. He was one of their kind of thinkers. How'd you connect? I asked him. I didn't he said, scratching his infected toe vigorously. They connected with me. Oh? Yeah, I was sleeping tight and not even dreaming. Someone rapped on my apartment door and I growled myself out of bed and sort of felt my way. It was three in the morning. Guy stood there looking apologetic. Got a message for you, he tells me. Can't it wait till morning? I snarl back. No, he says. It's important. So I invite him in. He doesn't waste any time at all. His first act is to point to an iron floor lamp in the corner and ask me how much I'd paid for it. I tell him. Then this bird drops twice the amount on the coffee table, strides over to the corner, picks up the lamp, and ties the iron pipe into a fancy-looking bow knot. He didn't even grunt. Mr. Mullaney, he asks me, how would you like to be that strong? I didn't have to think it over. I told him right then and there. Then we spent from 3 a.m. to 5.30 going through a fast question and answer routine, sort of like a complicated word association test. At 6 o'clock, I've packed and I'm on my way here with my case of Mextrum's disease. Just like that? I asked Mr. Mullaney. Just like that, he repeated. So now what happens? Oh, about tomorrow I'll go in for treatment, he said. Seems as how they've got to start treatment before the infection creeps to the first joint or I'll lose the joint. He contemplated me a bit. He was a perceptive and I knew it. You got another day or more. That's because your ring finger is longer than my toe. What's the treatment like? I asked him. That I don't know. I've tried to dig the treatment, but it's too far away from here. This is just a sort of preliminary ward. I gather that they know when to start and so on. He veiled his eyes for a moment. He was undoubtedly thinking of my fate. Chess? he asked, changing the subject abruptly. Why not? I grinned. My mind wasn't in it. He beat me three out of four. I bedded down about eleven, and to my surprise, I slept well. They must have been shoving something into me to make me sleep. I know me very well, and I'm sure that I couldn't have closed an eye if they hadn't been slipping me the old closeout powder. For three nights now, I'd corked off solid until seven ack Emma, and I'd come alive in the morning fine, fit, and fresh. But on the following morning, Mr. Mullaney was missing. I never saw him again. At noon or thereabouts, the end of the ring finger on my left hand was as solid as a rock. 
I could squeeze it in a door or burn it with a cigarette. I got into a little habit of scratching kitchen matches on it as I tried to dig into the solid flesh with my perception. I growled a bit at my fate, but not much. It was about this time, too, that the slight itch began to change. You know how a deep felt itch is. It can sometimes be pleasant, like the itch that comes after a fast swim in the salty sea and a dry out in the bright sun, when the drying salt water makes your skin itch with vibrant pleasure of just being alive. This is not like the bite of any bug, but the kind that makes you want to take another dive into the ocean instead of trying to scratch it with your claws. Well, the itch in my finger had been one of the pleasant kinds. I could sort of scratch it away by taking the steel-hard part of my finger in my other hand and wiggle briskly. But now the itch turned into a deep, burning pain. My perception, never good enough to dig the finer structure clearly, was good enough to tell me that my crawling horror had come to the boundary line of the first joint. It was this pause that was causing the burning pain. According to what I'd been told, if someone didn't do something about me right now, I'd lose the end joint of my finger. Nobody came to ease my pain, nor to ease my mind. They left me strictly alone. I spent the time from noon until three o'clock examining my fingertip as I'd not examined it before. It was rock hard, but strangely flexible if I could exert enough pressure on the flesh. It still moved with the flexing of my hands. The fingernail itself was like a chip of chilled steel. I could flex the nail neither with my other hand nor by biting it. Between my teeth it had the uncomfortable solidity of a sheet of metal that conveyed to my brain that the old teeth should not try to bite too hard. I tried prying on a bit of metal with the fingernail inserting the nail in the crack where a metal cylinder had been formed to make a table leg. I might have been able to pry the crack wider, but the rest of my body did not have the power nor the rigidity necessary to drive the tiny lever that was my fingertip. I wondered what kind of tool grinder they used for manicure. At 3.30, the door to my room opened and in came Scholar Phelps, complete with his benign smile and his hearty air. Well, he boomed over cheerfully, we meet again, Mr. Cornell. Under trying circumstances, I said. Unfortunately so, he nodded. However, we can't all be fortunate. I dislike being a vital statistic. Hmm, so does everybody. Yet from a philosophical point of view, you have no more right to live at the expense of someone else than someone else has a right to live at your expense. It all comes out even in the final accounting. And, of course, if every man were granted a guaranteed immortality, we'd have one cluttered-up world. I had to admit that he was right, but I still could not accept his statistical attitude. Not while I'm the statistic. He followed my thought, even though he was Esper. It wasn't hard to follow, anyway. All right, I admit that this is no time to sit around discussing philosophy or metaphysics or anything of that nature. What you are interested in is you. How absolutely correct. You know, of course, that you are a carrier. So I've come to believe... At least everybody I seem to have any contact with either turns up missing or comes down with Mechstrom's. Or both. Scholar Phelps nodded. You might have gone on for quite some time if it hadn't been so obvious. I eyed him. Just what went on? I asked casually. Did you have a clean-up squad following me all the time, picking up the debris? Or did you just pick up the ones you wanted? Or did the highways make you indulge in a running competition? Too many questions at once, most of which answers would be best that you did not know. Best for us, that is. Maybe even for you. I shrugged. We seem to be bordering on philosophy again when the important point is what you intend to do to me. 
He looked unhappy. Mr. Cornell, it is hard to remain unphilosophical in a case like this. So many avenues of thought have been opened, so many ideas and angles come to mind. We'll readily admit what you've probably concluded, that you as a carrier have become the one basic factor that we have been seeking for some twenty years and more. You are the dirigible force, the last brick in the building, the final answer. Or, and I hate to say it, were. Were. For all of our knowledge of Mextrums, we know so very little, he said. In certain maladies, the carrier is himself immune. In some, we observe that the carrier results from a low-level incomplete infection with the disease, which immunizes him but does not kill the bugs. In others, we've seen the carrier become normal after he has finally contracted the disease. What we must know now is, is Steve Cornell, the Mextrum carrier, now a non-carrier because he has contracted the disease? How are you going to find out? I asked him. That's a problem, he said thoughtfully. One school feels that we should not treat you since the treatment itself may destroy whatever unknown factor makes you a carrier. The other claims that if we don't treat you, you'll hardly live long enough to permit comprehensive research anyway. A third school believes that there is time to find out whether you are still a carrier, make some tests, and then treat you, after which these tests are to be repeated. Rather bitterly, I said, I suppose I have absolutely no vote. Hardly. His face was pragmatic. And to which school do you belong? I asked sourly. Do you want me to get the cure? Or am I to die miserably while you take tabs on my blood pressure? Or do I merely lose an arm while you're sitting with folded hands waiting for the laboratory report? In any case, we'll learn a lot about Mextrums from you, he said. Even if you die. As caustically as I could, I said, It's nice to know that I am not going to die in vain. He eyed me with contempt. You're not afraid to die, are you, Mr. Cornell? That's a dirty question to ask any man. Sure, I'm afraid to die. I just don't like the idea of being not alive. As bad as life is, it's better than nothing. But the way he put the question, he was implying that I should be happy to die for the benefit of humanity in general. And that's a question that is unfairly loaded. After all, everybody is slated to kick off. There is no other way of resigning from the universe. So if I have to die, it might as well be for the benefit of something. And if it happens to be humanity, so much the better. But when the case is proffered on a silver tray, I feel... Somebody else, not me. The next argument Phelps would be tossing out would be the one that goes, 2,000 years ago a man died for humanity, which always makes me sick. No matter how you look at us, there is no resemblance between him and me. I cut him short before he could say it. Whether or not I'm afraid to die and for good or evil, now or later, is beside the point. I have, obviously, nothing to say about the time, place, and the reasons. We sat there and glared at one another. He didn't know whether to laugh or snarl, and I didn't care which he did. It seemed to me that he was leading up to something that looked like the end. Then I'd get the standard funeral and statements would be given out that I'd died because medical research had not been able to save me and blah, blah, blah complete with lack of funds and the medical center charity drive. The result would mean more moolah for Phelps and higher efficiency for his operations, and to devil with the rest of the world. Let's get along with it, I snapped. I've no opinion, no vote, no right of appeal. Why bother to ask me how I feel? Calmly, he replied, 
Because I am not a rough-shod, unhuman monster, Mr. Cornell. I would prefer that you see my point of view, or at least enough of it to admit that there is a bit of right on my side. Seems to me I went through that with Thorndyke. This is another angle. I'm speaking of my right of discovery. You're speaking of what? My right of discovery. You as an engineer should be familiar with the idea. If I were a poet, I could write an ode to my love and no one would forbid me my right to give it to her and to nobody else. If I were a cook with a special recipe, no one could demand that I hand it over unless I had a special friend. He who discovers something new should be granted the right to control it. If this Mextrum business were some sort of physical patent or some new process, I could apply for a patent and have it for my exclusive use for a period of 17 years. Am I not right? Yes, but... Except that my patent would be infringed upon and I'd have no control. I stood up suddenly and faced him angrily. He did not cower. After all, he was a Mextrum. But he did shut up for a moment. Seems to me, I snarled, that any process that can be used to save human life should not be held secret, patentable, or under the control of any one man or group. This is an argument that always comes up. You may, of course, be correct. But happily for me, Mr. Cornell, I have the process and you have not and it is my own conviction that I have the right to use it on those people who seem, in my opinion, to hold the most for the future advancement of the human race. However, I do not care to go over this argument again. It is tiresome, and it never ends. As one of the ancient Greek philosophers observed, you cannot change a man's mind by arguing with him. The other fact remains, however that you do have something to offer us, despite your contrary mental processes. Do go on. What do I have to do to gain this benefit? Who do I have to kill? I eyed him cynically and then added, Or is it, whom shall I kill? I like these things to be proper, you know. Don't be sarcastic. I'm serious, he told me. Then stop pussyfooting and come to the point, I snapped. You know what the story is. I don't. So if you think I'll be interested, why not tell me instead of letting me find out the hard way? You, of course, were a carrier. Maybe you still are. We can find out. In fact, we'll have to find out before we... For God's sake, stop it, I yelled. You're meandering. Sorry, he said in a tone of apology that surprised me all the way down to my feet. He shook himself visibly and went on from there. You, if still a carrier, can be of use to the medical center. Now do you understand? Sure, I understood, but good. As a normal human type, they held nothing over me and just shoved me here and there and picked up the victims after me. But now that I was a victim myself, they could offer me their cure only if I would swear to go around the country deliberately infecting the people they wanted among them. It was that, or lie there and die miserably. This had not come to Scholar Phelps as a sudden flash of genius. He'd been planning this all along, had been waiting to pop this delicate question until after I'd been pushed around, had a chance to torture myself mentally, and was undoubtedly soft for anything that looked like salvation. There is one awkward point, said Scholar Phelps suavely. Once we have cured you, we would have no hold on you other than your loyalty and your personal honor to fulfill a promise given. Neither of us are naive, Mr. Cornell. We both know that any honorable promise is only as valid as the basic honor involved. Since your personal opinion is that this medical treatment should be used indiscriminately, 
and that our program to better the human race by competitive selection is foreign to your feelings, you would feel honor-bound to betray us. Am I not correct? What could I say to that? First I'm out, then I'm in, now I'm out again. What was Phelps getting at? If our positions were reversed, Mr. Cornell, I'm sure that you'd seek some additional binding force against me. I shall continue to seek some such lever against you for the same reason. In the meantime, Mr. Cornell, we shall make a test to see whether we have any real basis for agreement at all. You may have ceased to be a carrier, you know. Yeah, I admitted darkly. In the meantime, he said cheerfully, the least we can do is to treat your finger. I'd hate to have you hedge a deal because we did not deliver your cured body in the hole. He put his head out of the door and summoned a nurse who came with a black bag. From the bag, Scholar Phelps took a skin blast hypo and a small metal box the top of which held a small, slender, jointed platform and some tiny straps. He strapped my finger to this platform and then plugged in a length of line cord to the nearest wall socket. The little platforms moved. The one nearest my wrist vibrated rapidly across a very small excursion that tickled like the devil. The end platform moved in an arc, flexing the fingertip from straight to about 70 degrees. This moved fairly slow, but regularly up and down. I'll not fool you, he said dryly. This is gonna hurt. He set the skin blast hypo on top of the joint and let it go. For a moment, the finger felt cold, numb, pleasant. Then the shock wore away, and the tip of my finger, my whole finger, and part of my hand shocked me with the most excruciating agony that the hide of man ever felt. Flashes and waves of pain darted up my arm to the elbow, and the muscles in my forearm jumped. The sensitive nerve in my elbow sang and sent darting waves of zigzag needles up to my shoulder. My hand was a source of searing heat and freezing cold, and the pain of being crushed and twisted and wrenched out of joint all at the same time. Phelps wiped my wet face with a towel, loaded another hypo, and let me have it in the shoulder. Gradually the stuff took hold and the awful pain began to subside. Not all the way, it just diminished from absolutely unbearable to merely terrible. I knew at that moment why a trapped animal will bite off its own foreleg to get free of the trap. From the depths of his bag he found a bottle and poured a half tumbler for me. It went down like a whiskey-flavored soft drink. It had about as much kick as when you pour a drink of water into a highball glass that still holds a dreg of melted ice and diluted liquor. But it burned like fury once it hit my stomach, and my mind began to wobble. He'd given me a slug of the pure quill, one hundred proof. As some sort of counter-irritant, it worked. Very gradually, the awful pain in my hand began to subside. You can take that manipulator off in an hour or so, he told me. And in the meantime, we'll get along with our testing. I gathered that they could stop this treatment anywhere along the process if I did not measure up. End of Chapter 17